So hello everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure and uh, privilege to uh, introduce our next keynote speaker, Professor Mohamed Megrid. Professor Megrid is a professor and department chair at McGill University. His research span in two primary areas of specializations. The first is subsurface structures, including tunnel and buried culvert. The second is geosynthetic engineering. He completed his master and PhD at Western University in London, Ontario, with one year spent at the University of Alberta taking PhD level courses. He then spent one year as a postdoc at Queen University, followed by one year working for the industry before joining Mac University in 2004. He is currently a member of the Trottier Institute of Sustainability in Engineering and Design at Mac University and an active member of the Geosynthetic Technical Committee of the AFCE Geo Institute. He is also a board member of the Canadian Society for Civil Engineering. Professor McGuid is the recipient of the 2022 Geosynthetic Research Award from the Canadian Geotechnical Society for the contribution to the understanding of the soil geosynthetic interactions. Professor McGuid is also the editor-in-chief of Geotechnical and Geological Engineering Journal and served as associate editor for several other journals, including Geotextile and Geomembranes, and also the Canadian Geotechnical and Journal. He is also a dedicated teacher. In 2010, he received a Samuel and Ida Thompson Award for outstanding teaching in the faculty of engineering at McGill University. I can testify for it personally because he is also my supervisor and I was the very first uh, graduate student of him. On the personal side, Professor McGuid has served as a soccer coach for three years in the West Island of Montreal, and he volunteered at the Stroke and Turn Church for many swimming competitions in Quebec. My fellow colleagues, please uh, welcome Professor McGuid as a last keynote speaker of the second Rock Science International Conference. Thank you, Keen. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today. And I would like to thank Rock Science for extending this invitation to me to, uh, to speak today. Um, for colleagues here in the room, I'm sure um, we always appreciate having a smart and intelligent PhD student. Um, Keen was one of those. Um, it's a blessing to have a good PhD student at the beginning of one's career but it's also a challenge to manage these students. Maybe you agree with me. Um, Keen did a fantastic job. He spent uh, quite a bit of uh, time at McGill. He did his masters and uh, PhD at McGill. So um, we had so much fun for about five years or so. All right, so um, today I have um, a couple of thoughts that I would like to share with you. Um, I was hoping that, uh, is Professor Morgan Stern still around? He's gone. Okay, so um, just a bit of anecdote before I start, because what the short bio did not uh, say is, uh, what did I do in the one year I spent at the University of Alberta as a PhD student? And um, I was so lucky to uh, be able to take a couple of courses with uh, Professor Morgenstern at the time, back in 1998. And um, it's a, such a privilege. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of, um, our observation as graduate students at the time. So Professor Morgenstern would um, walk into the classroom, of course with no PowerPoints, and of course with no notes whatsoever. He has a chalk in his hand, that's basically it. And he would spend about an hour and a half presenting slope stability case histories with all the details of failure, dates, etc., right from the, again, top of his mind. It's amazing. Um, I made this one of my career goals, as a matter of fact, to be able one day to walk into a classroom and be able to speak for even 20 minutes without having to use my PowerPoint slides. It's, a, I just, uh, it's a, such an honor. Okay, so um, that takes me to my presentation. And um, before I share the thoughts with you, I would like to uh, reflect a little bit on the title of my presentation that includes um, two terms. One of them is transportation geostructures, 
and the second is climate change. So I will start with the first one, transportation geostructures. And uh, in the context of today's presentation, I'm referring here to the geotechnical components used in transportation systems. And some examples are given here. So these structures are continuously exposed to various environmental factors, talking about precipitation, talking about temperature, humidity, etc. Of course, I'm not going to be able to cover all these structures, but I'll focus today probably on one or two of these transportation infrastructure. The second term uh, in my title of my presentation is climate change. I'm not a climate change expert, but I, I do have colleagues who are, and uh, I've had a chance to spend some time discussing basics of climate change with them. And what I learned is that climate change refers to the long-term shift in daily, seasonal, and annual temperature and weather patterns. And um, up until about 1830, uh, this was considered to be natural and very slow phenomena, talking about uh, probably attributed to only volcanic eruptions, photosynthesis, etc. And then starting from the Industrial Revolution, the climate change started to be much more intensified. And uh, again, this is due to probably the excessive use of fossil fuel, uh, deforestation, use of petrochemicals, etc. And this has resulted in significant increase in extreme events uh, that we can now see across the globe. If we um, focus our attention on Canada, there is an interesting report that has been published by the Government of Canada in 2019, titled uh, Canada's Climate Change Report. And um, that report reveals that the mean temperature across the country has increased by about three degrees in the winter and about one and a half degree in the summer. It's really interesting. And if you look at the upper map, it shows that that increase in temperature was not uniform across the country. It's actually more in the north than in the south. And if we look at precipitation, the lower map, it's a really interesting pattern as well. You look at the uh, uh, precipitation pattern here, uh, we're talking about about 20% increase between uh, 1948 and 2012. And uh, this again was larger in northern Canada than, the southern, than southern Canada. And the report explains the reason why there is kind of similarity and strong correlation between the two maps, the temperature and precipitation. And this was explained by the fact that water retention capacity of air increases by about 7% for every one degree warming. So what is happening as temperature increases, the capacity of air to retain and hold water increases. And that increase leads to, again, more and more precipitation events. Now, how does that relate to transportation infrastructure? Well, I'll share with you here a little bit of a schematic that uh, basically will um, walk us through the process how temperature increase and climate change can be related to transportation infrastructure. So this is broken down here in the chart into three main categories. The first category relates to the uh, melting of glaciers. So increase in temperature would lead to melting of glaciers, which means that we're talking about rise in sea level, increase in wave energy, coastal erosion. And of course, if we have an increase in temperature, we're talking about, again, another increase in latent um, heat of air. That's the, uh, the heat that develops due to the change of the moisture held in the air. And if this happens in northern Canada, that could lead leads to thaw permafrost. It could also lead to rise in sea level. And if it happens in more of an arid area, this could lead to droughts, acid rains, soil degradation. And these have direct impact on, again, many of our geostructures. The last, the third category, relates to the increase in moisture retention capacity. And again, as I mentioned, this have direct impact on precipitation, could lead to floods, increasing groundwater level, and poor water pressure. Now, with this out of the way, takes me to the first thought I'd like to share with you. And the two thoughts I'd like to share with you today, very related to the map I just presented, talking about moisture 
and temperature. So of course, I'll focus only on embankments, um, again on soft soils, um, again with the areas where there is crossing uh, of culverts. And the question that I would like to pose here today is, is conventional design sufficient given the implications of climate change? How can we control the additional moisture introduced into transportation systems to ensure long-term performance? So to answer this question, and before I go any further, uh, I would like to go quickly over the conventional design of embankments over weak foundation. So typically when an engineer is tasked with the design of one of these transportation embankments, we start by looking into satisfying the two criteria. Ultimate limited states, making, making sure that there is no risk of shear failure, and uh, what we call the serviceability limited states, which means that we try to ensure that uh, settlement is kept to within tolerable limits. Also, it has been established that uh, geosynthetics uh, can be used as effective approach to build embankments uh, on soft soils, and this is explained in the next slide here. So, um, of course, the behavior of geosynthetic reinforced embankment is very well understood now. And uh, if you grab the book by Jules in 1996, it summarizes many of the um, um, conventional design approaches. And again, uh, the presence of basal reinforcement underneath embankment has been proven to uh, help with the uh, taking some of the earth pressure or lateral earth pressure developing within the embank embankment and thereby increasing the bearing capacity and the overall stability. If you open the Canadian Foundation Engineering Manual, you see this. So this is basically the approach that has been um, um, recommended by CFEM as far as uh, looking at the design of embankments over soft soils. This was after Rowan Soderman, 1987. And uh, they considered the effect of uh, undrained shear strength increase with depth and also the thickness of the soil deposit. And they came up with a couple of charts, uh, basically one to give you a burning capacity factor involving the effect of reinforcement and again, overall safety factor for the, uh, for the soil. And if the safety factor that is required for the proposed embankment is less than the factor safety obtained using this approach, then reinforcement would essentially allow you to build the embankment to the design height. And if not, then in addition to the reinforcement, you will have to consider other provisions, for example, uh, the provision of berms or the use of lightweight fill material, use of PVDs, etc. cetera. Um, back in the 80s, when we started to talk about controlling uh, ground movement and settlement, uh, that was the work done by Giroud in the 80s, looking at how can we utilize geosynthetics as drainage material. And for that, thick geotextile drains were proposed, and the idea was very simple. Um, it basically, if we are to use one of those geosynthetic fabric between the embankment and the foundation soil, then assuming that there is one dimensional consolidation happening, then what would happen is water would seep into the, um, the, the fabric and move laterally. And um, a method was proposed to determine the, what we call the required transmissivity of the material. And a simple equation is given here. Also, charts were developed to allow for the hydraulic properties to be obtained for a given um, stress level. Two conditions are needed for drainage methods, for this drainage methods to work. So keep that in mind. And I'll come back to that probably once or twice during my presentation. This is very, very important comment here and observation. For this method to work, um, we have to have a fully saturated system and also, we need to have a hydraulic head difference between the soil and the geotic style. Otherwise, water would not move. And the industry came up with a lot of development. There was an explosion of products that are available on the market where you can actually um, use one of what we call the geo composites. It's basically a flexible polyethylene that is heat bonded to one or two layers of geosynthetic fabrics, at, either at the top and the bottom or on one side. And this was used extensively as a solution for drainage in these cases. The question is, do these products provide drainage solutions for all conditions? And the answer is no. They don't work all the time. 
What are the issues? Why these products do not work? Well, if you um, are dealing with conventional embankment, typically we're talking about unsaturated condition. And in these conditions, what research uh, revealed is that the presence of a sheet of these fabric in the soil actually works as an impermeable layer. And what happened is, if have a heavy rainfall, water would actually pond on top of this material for more than above 10 centimeters. They don't work. They do not actually work as intended under unsaturated condition. How can we explain that? This is a material at high porosity. It is supposed to work. It is supposed to transfer water inside the soil. But this is not the case. And I'll share with you here a simple experiment. This is basically a soil column. And you have inside the column one of those fabrics. And the idea is we would like to see when exactly this fabric is going to start working and transport water laterally. And uh, what do you see here on the, um, on the uh, chart is a relationship between pool water pressure. So we have a couple of moisture sensors above and below and also a couple of pool pressure transducers trying to get some sense of what is happening as we add water to the system. So you add 10 liters of water and no water is transported. And uh, you keep on adding water until you reach certain threshold. In this case, about 20 liters of water. Only at that time, you look at the shaded area, the extreme right side of the chart, this is only when the, the, the fabric started to work and started to transport water. Why? Well, this is explained by what we call the, the capillary break phenomena. It's very well known in the unsaturated soil mechanics field. Basically, you have a material that has very low hydraulic conductivity, let's say fine grain material, and then you have the geosynthetic with the larger pores. That's basically a material with a higher um, hydraulic conductivity. So what happens is that the material of the low hydraulic conductivity, the fine material, these, this material would restrict the movement of water into the larger pore material only until certain suction level is reached. And at that level, the two hydraulic conductivities will become equal and then water will start to flow. And we call that the capillary, uh, the, the, cup, the, 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 uh, the, the break suction or the, the suction level where the, uh, the capillary barrier is broken and we call it faded away barrier. So this explains why these materials may or may not work depending on the saturation condition of the embankments. But talking about climate change, we're not always in saturated condition. It's very hard to guarantee that. So we have to be very careful when we design these systems and use them for transportation embankments. So one of the questions that may arise would be, uh, what's wrong with having a little bit of moisture in embankments? Uh, does, is that dangerous? Is that not good for the embankment? Well, research, this was published paper in 2020, and people conducted uh, research to try to identify what happened with the change in humidity inside transportation embankment, and how does that affect the overall mechanical performance of the system. And um, what, he, what, the, what has been revealed in this study is that um, change in humidity can definitely influence the mechanical performance of embankment, as well as the burning capacity of the pavement structure. And um, when we talk about climate change and precipitation, we're talking about a system that is ex exposed to very, various type of uh, weather events and uh, sources of water it could be introduced due to migration of water upward from the groundwater level or downward through the cracks that would develop in the, in the asphalt, et cetera. And this results in a system that is not guaranteed to be saturated all the time. We have a system that is highly unsaturated. And um, people started to think about what can we do to control moisture and humidity inside embankments to avoid this degradation in the mechanical performance. And they came up with ideas. One idea is to use products that are specifically designed to allow for not only moisture, but also humidity to be collected. And um, this is what we call the wicking geotextile material. It's a material that has been treated uh, with um, hydrophilic and hygroscopic coating. It's basically, uh, as we'll see in the next slide, allows for not only moisture, but also humidity to be collected and directed outside the embankment. This is a cross section, one of those products that are available nowadays. Uh, this is woven material. It's a wicking geotextile. 
And um, what you see here is a cross section that shows how this material is made. It's basically uh, grooves that are treated with hydrophilic and hygroscopic uh, material to attract surface water, pore water, as well as moisture. And uh, you see in the cross section here, this is very, again, uh, we can kind of zoom into that, uh, these yarns to try to understand how do they work. There are specific channels that have been created such that they are not only, um, not only attract water, but also attract humidity as well. So unlike conventional drainage, wicking is mainly conducted in unsaturated condition. And we're talking about that what drives the flow here is not relative hydraulic gradient, it's actually relative humidity that drives the, the, uh, the collection of water. And people went even beyond that. They started to think about if this is working for uh, woven material, is it possible to use that also for non-woven material? Can we coat non-woven material such that it allows also for the collection of humidity and water to uh, be moved out of the embankments. And um, there are a lot of uh, research that is undergoing nowadays to try to look into uh, this sort of products, understand uh, how do they work under, let's say, vertical pressure, different uh, relative humidity, what are the issues associated with the presence of these products. Uh, what are, one of the good uh, positives of this using such products is the fact that they actually uh, can uniformly distribute moisture within embankment. And this is really a, one of the main issues, um, differential settlements. So if you have variability in moisture inside an embankment with the change in weather patterns, you can end up with change in and, and movements from one side to the other. So having a product that would allow you to, um, again, uniformly distribute moisture across, even if it does not get rid of entire, entirely from the, of the moisture, allows it to distribute uniformly, that's even a positive sign that the product is actually working. And um, as engineers, we try always, when we start look, look into new product, to think about what are the standards? Is there an ESTM that we can use? And um, um, this is one of the uh, standard tests that was not developed for geotechnical applications. It actually came from the aviation industry. But it has been uh, used to try to see if this really, if we are to coat the, um, the uh, non-woven material with this sort of coating, would this help the material to really work properly, attract moisture and water under unsaturated condition, zero hydraulic head, and drive it outside the embankment. And this is one of the simple tests. You have here a relationship uh, between the suction and the versus time, and you can see that there is uh, some sort of a um, um, rapid increase initially as you are introducing moisture um, at a zero hydraulic gradient and allowing the water to move under unsaturated condition. Of course, there is another couple of tests that people use. One of them is capillarized test. This is a standard test used in, um, um, in research. And uh, the idea is you basically lower one of those strips into a container and allow the water to um, to be sucked up towards the, the top of the strip and measure, in this case, what we call matrix suction. It's um, in this context, it's a, uh, the suction component that relates to the height um, to which water can be drawn or sucked up into the unsaturated medium. And uh, those who are familiar with the unsaturated soil mechanics, this is the standard uh, typical water tension curve. And you can use that to, to obtain the, um, the, um, the, the zero or void, uh, which is basically the point where uh, drainage begins and you can find the residual value, um, et cetera. So this is one of the tests that is, can be used. It's called the hanging column test. Well, this material alone is not gonna help because yes, you could control drainage, but most of the times when we deal with heavy embankments, it is much more than that. We need to, again, ensure that whatever we put into the embankments would actually serve the purpose. So in addition to drainage, we also would like to have a material that would help increase the burning capacity and uh, reduce settlement. And, and for that, people start to think about, is it possible to use one of those wicking, uh, non-woven geotextile material, and we can heat bond that to, for example, a geogrid. How does it work? Would this really help to do the dual action of drainage as well as improving burning capacity. And um, what you see here is, a, is an example. So basically, 
you would like to see if this material would present the same interlocking we would get with we get only with geogrid. Geogrid is known to be a material that is that would rely heavily on the interlocking with particles uh, for resistance. And uh, having a geotextile bonded directly into the geogrid may not help. You may actually have you reduce that capability in your uh, in your system. And for that, we need to do some tests. And um, this is an example here of a direct shear test that has been performed on one of these materials. And the idea is to try to identify where exactly this material fits. Would it, the resistance fit uh, near the geotextile only, or would it fit near the core sand, which would be the upper limit? So we have now lower and upper limit. And um, interesting enough that this material seems to perform reasonably well as far as the interlocking ability, and depending on which plane you're shearing the material against. So if you shear the material, for example, against the geogrid, you get a higher uh, friction angle. If you shear it along the geotextile, you get a different friction angle. But in both cases, the material seems to perform uh, reasonably well in this case. You can also do some loading tests, and this is the work that uh, my research group has been involved in in the past couple of years, looking at um, how does this material respond to cyclic loading. And um, it seems to be uh, interesting. We looked at a wide range of subgrade material, uh, very soft, medium, and, and, uh, and other material. And this is an example. I'm not being able to share all the charts here, but this is one of them. Um, so this is an example that shows how the, um, the presence of one of those layers in an embankment in this way, in this case a railway embankment, would help improve the performance, reduce settlements. So there is a significant decrease. So the upper line here represents the unreinforced uh, case. And then we have multiple lines right below to show how the uh, location of the geogrid layer or the geocomposite layer would affect the settlement. So you can move the, the layer or, or the reinforcement layer up and down uh, closer to the load or uh, lower than the load to try to see how does that affect the, the performance. So very quickly, before I move into the second thought, I would like to uh, give you guys a take home message. So the take home message, number one, that I would like to share with you today is that climate change is likely to impact the long term performance of our transportation infrastructure. And also, we recommend to include provisions to control moisture under unsaturated conditions. And that takes me to the second thought. And as I mentioned, I'll just try to tie my thoughts to the very first slide when I talked about the impact of climate change on transportation infrastructure. And I broke that down into temperature and, 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 uh, and moisture. Here I would like to talk about how temperature would affect the design of these structures. And the question that I would like to pose here, is performing thermal analysis necessary for the design of geostructures? in cold climate, and what is considered sufficient? We have a wide range of analyses that could be conducted, ranging from uh, simple heat conduction analysis that uh, Dr. Ahmed Ibrahim, one of my postdocs, gave a presentation just right before here, uh, right before the keynote lecture uh, in one of the sessions about the, um, the heat conduction analysis, or do we need to do a fully uh, coupled analysis, thermomechanical, uh, hydrothermomechanical coupling, and this is this is basically the objective of um, of this part of the presentation. Now, what you see here is uh, uh, two culverts that um, that exist in Manitoba, and uh, the left hand side here shows uh, the condition of these culverts in the spring. Right hand side shows the condition of the same culvert in the winter. So, apparently, there is a, a again significant variability when it comes to temperature and impact on, on these um, culverts running under embankments. Um, so in seasonally freezing environments, we need to look into both the, again, frost heave as well as, as I mentioned before, the moisture induced uh, de-stresses in the embankments. And um, there are two arguments that um, if you, um, if those who are interested in uh, climate change mitigation probably have heard about these two arguments many times in the past. Um, what do we do with the, um, uh, the thaw of permafrost, for example, in northern Canada? And uh, one um, argument favors the fact that we should continue to protect permafrost uh, under geostructures. 
and uh, other arguments, people argue that permafrost thaw is unavoidable and uh, we should adapt. So between these two, again, paradigms, there are a lot of discussion and people are looking into what needs to be done in the next 30, 50 years in order to make sure that our uh, transportation infrastructure would survive the, um, uh, continue to survive the climate change. Uh, these are some of the commonly used mitigation measures and uh, uh, those of you who are involved in um, practice in northern Canada, you're very familiar with the thermosiphons, basically heat exchangers that allow for the cooling of the permafrost throughout the, the year. Also people um, use the high albedo surfaces, basically reflection of, of rays to make sure that embankments do not warm and do not transfer that uh, heat to the ground. And uh, um, also that was part of Ahmed's presentation this, uh, this morning is air, uh, air conviction embankments that utilize large crushed rocks to build the entire embankment or parts of it to promote natural convection of air inside embankments. Um, since I'm dealing with geosynthetics, there's also a role that geosynthetics play in, in terms of protecting permafrost and uh, for that, um, geofoam insulation has been used uh, in parts of Canada. Um, and also protecting frost heave um, using wicking geotextiles. As far as a strength enhancement, people think about uh, the composites that we presented earlier. Uh, my colleagues in the past, uh, yet today and also yesterday talked about data. Uh, it's really critical that we uh, understand the importance of uh, collecting um, sufficient data to allow us to calibrate our numerical models. And um, there is a need, of course, to, uh, to make sure that this data is uh, of high quality and allow us to, um, allow us to carry out the, the numerical modeling required. Um, and uh, that takes me to the need for numerical modeling um, of embankments. And um, in terms of thermal analysis, this is really an interesting topic. Um, this is an embankment. I think this is one of the case um, studies that came from Yukon Territory. And um, this is uh, 2018 um, case study where uh, an instrumentation was um, placed to try to collect temperature data. And the idea here is, can we really simulate what is happening to the heat distribution within the embankments and underneath the embankments um, due to the seasonal variation in temperature. What you see here is the change in temperature uh, between uh, 2008 and 2014. And um, you can use that to calibrate a model uh, using the blue lines that you see here, but also you can use it to impose scenarios if you would like to see what happens in 20 years as far as uh, change in temperature. You can pose these scenarios and uh, once you calibrate a model you should be able to run simulations to try to understand the impact of that on the on the embankment. This is a sample of the um, basic conductive heat transfer analysis. We're not talking about anything here complicated. It's a very simple heat conduction analysis and um, this is basically um, uh, the results obtained using the software uh, in October 2013, that's comparing data um, calculation versus measured. And uh, what you see here is the distribution with depth at the center of the embankments. So these uh, lines represent the calculated response and uh, or distribution of pressures. And these triangles and circles represent the measured values. And uh, despite the fact this is very simple heat conduction analysis, sometimes it helps to try to get some sense of uh, what is happening away from the uh, monitored areas. If you would like to uh, look at the embankment response, I think it would be very, help very helpful to do some sort of a numerical analysis, get some contour lines similar to what you see here. Uh, you can also expand that and look at scenarios. And what you see here is looking at what happened if we increase um, temperature by, let's say, 20% or so, what happens to the temperature um, at the center of the embankment. Um, if you have a culvert crossing underneath an embankment, this is a, another complication and you need to pay attention here. 
because you're basically changing the boundary conditions. So what you see here is a culvert running underneath an embankment. So you have an airflow boundary condition, not only at the top, but also at the bottom of the, um, of the embankments. And uh, if you would like to think about why this is important, I mean, is that really critical? And the answer is yes. If you look at, um, in the absence of any culverts or bird structure underneath the embankments, if this is the thrust depth, and uh, once you introduce the boundary condition, you're actually changing the thrust depth significantly around the culvert area. Um, and again, is that really important? Yes, because think about that as a, a cross section and you move far from the culvert and you have another cross section that is experiencing very different movements. So having, um, having a culvert really calls for um, ensuring that this will not significantly affect the differential movement um, of the structure. And what you see here is a real case study uh, where you have the presence of a culvert led to cracking of a brand new concrete uh, asphalt system that is um, a pavement system that is uh, properly installed, but because we did not pay enough attention to the fact that there was a culvert crossing underneath the, um, underneath the, the, the pavement that this crack appeared. Um, so if you think about uh, numerical modeling again, which would be very helpful to look at uh, one snapshot and see how does that relate to the, um, the benchmark case. So the upper diagram shows the benchmark case when we have or a cross section away from the culvert and the lower one shows a cross section where the culvert exists. And you can see significant difference in the temperature distribution, which means that as we'll see in the next slide or so, this would have an impact also on other properties, including uh, movement, displacement, stress distribution, et cetera. Um, if you, um, this was a slide that shows the one before, shows what happens in the, in the winter, but if you talk about July, for example, introducing hot air inside the culvert would really cause significant change in the distribution of pressure within the embankment. And what you see here is, is really alarming that uh, if we do not pay enough attention here and you're thinking about um, uh, permafrost and uh, protecting permafrost in this case would be very hard unless you really do something to ensure that the heat does not propagate into the subsurface. Uh, this is a project in Manitoba. So what we're trying to do here is basically to introduce geofoam as an insulation system underneath culverts. And the idea is just like what you, see, what you have seen in the previous slide that um, we're trying to ensure that the propagation of um, propagation of the frost zone does not go deep in the ground. You can run, as I mentioned, simple convection analysis and you end up with, again, again um, um, validation that looks like what you see here. And um, definitely, if you look at the numerical modeling, what we see here is um, basically um, a parametric study where you can place the geofoam insulation at different locations that try to understand how do they impact the distribution of the frozen zone or the extent of the frozen zone. And um, um, what we realized is that the presence of this layer around the culvert did not actually help at all. It did not do much benefit as far as insulation goes. And um, placing it above or below um, did not help. The only condition where this became effective is when it was actually wrapped around the culvert. So this is where we we'll tried to arrest the, the, uh, the movement of, uh, of hot air or cold air outside the culvert. So the big question mark here is what else do we need to know? And uh, although pure thermal analysis that I've talked about can yield useful solutions, uh, there's much um, remains unknown. And uh, what happens to effective stresses? What happened to stress strain um, distributions with temperature? Uh, what happens to shear strength? What happens to water movement, et cetera? So these are all questions that we cannot answer using simple uh, thermal analysis. But um, can we do fully coupled analysis? The answer is yes, but it's bloody difficult. It is complicated. It requires you to look into multiple differential equations that you see here, uh, thermal energy balance, mass conservation of water species, talking about water, ice, and vapor, uh, gas mass balance, mechanical stress strain behavior, et cetera. This is really complicated problems. And people start to look, okay, can I use that method to analyze an element? And probably yes. At element level, it is possible and computationally feasible. And you can do that. You, you can choose multiple elements, multiple locations, multiple boundary conditions, and you can examine that numerically. It will be very feasible. 
All right, okay, so this is just the last example I would like to share with you what happens with just one single element um, and try to compare the fully coupled analysis with the average thermal expansion coefficient approach. It's not very complicated that you can do using many softwares, including RS2, which is the software that we used for this comparison here. So what you see here is um, basically, number one, temperature distribution. And then number two, you can actually now, since we, we incorporated the thermal expansion coefficient, it's an average value. But if you incorporate that, you are actually producing some meaningful expansion or movement of the, uh, of the element that is comparable to what you would find um, in uh, using fully coupled analysis. Uh, this is not the end of it, this is the beginning. The problem is much more complicated. We're dealing with much more complicated system of solar structure interaction. And uh, there's a lot to be done. What happens to the uh, reinforcement itself under um, temperature variation? This is another study that we've conducted um, um, last year looking into the stiffness and the strength of these materials under very high or very low temperature. So you can basically do series of tensile tests under various temperatures and measure the variation of stiffness, which what you see here on the charts, temperature versus stiffness at 1%, 2%, 3% strain, et cetera. And that allows you to understand the individual material response, but it's not enough to understand the response of the system. Response of these systems uh, would be complicated and a lot of research is still ongoing trying to understand what happens uh, with the formation of ice lenses, what happens to stress strain distribution, what happens to effective stresses in these conditions. It's a still big question mark and a lot of research that is still ongoing. So the take home message number two here is that um, definitely we can use simplified thermal analysis um, to identify suitable solutions for the design of transportation geostructures. Um, care should be taken when burn structure crosses an embankment as boundary conditions will lead to a different local response and possibly differential movement. General concluding remarks, there's a need to revisit the conventional design approach for transportation geostructures to account for the possible effects of climate change. When designing a transportation embankment, we may need to recommend the use of drainage systems that would work under unsaturated condition. And finally, software and design tools will need to be expanded to allow engineers to carry out design that involves temperature scenarios. And um, I would like to thank all the research group at McGill and my graduate students, uh, technical staff, as well as the funding agencies. And thank you. Thank you very much, Professor McGrid, for your excellent presentation and very thank informative. You. And please accept a small gift from us no. as a souvenir. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time left and uh, for a couple of questions. Uh, any questions for Professor McGrid? Thank you very much, Professor McGrid, for your excellent presentation. My pleasure. Um, I now live in Ghana. So when I first saw the COVIDs, I was expecting that the frozen zone will be smaller, not bigger. Then I realized this is Canada. It's the reverse. <laughs> so it's quite interesting that the modeling can show some of these things. Have you seen people start using these ideas in practice? And will these make it into the design codes? Excellent question. Um, that's the role of the university research. We're, we're trying now to, in collaboration with industry partners, to do some pilot projects. We started with uh, lab size research, and now we're moving into um, doing some pilot tests on site to try to see um, how this, um, these results obtained in the lab would be applicable to large scale problems. And um, that includes uh, trial embankments, uh, that includes um, looking into buried culverts um, with an instrumentation and see how does the presence, for example, of wicking geotextile would help uh, redistribute the moisture content, uh, alleviate, alleviate the uh, differential movement, et cetera. So I think this is always starts at the university level at the, in the lab and then this propagates. And there's a lot of work done around the world in these areas. It's not um, only in Canada. There's um, groups, um, research groups uh, that are doing similar research um, elsewhere in the world. And I think the results that I'm presenting here is a collection of results that um, things that we've done here in Canada. And there are other results that are coming from 
across the globe, but eventually I believe this would, would, uh, would result in us introducing new, new methodologies that would be used by engineers in the future. You focused on embankments. Has there been any attention focused on deep foundations and the uh, potential for downdrag and its potential impacts? Yeah, this is um, a group at McGill, the climate change group at McGill. Uh, we do have two, three professors who are specialized in, in climate change, teamed up with the University of Laval, and they're working on pile foundations. And um, the idea is, is to come up with um, sort of um, general recommendations that, um, that is basically um, location dependent. We're exactly in Canada, we're talking, because um, moving further north means that you are introducing uh, different conditions. And, and I think the idea, uh, the consortium that is formed between McGill and La University Laval, the cold, um, the cold region uh, group, they're working on exactly that, looking at uh, deep foundations. And I think there is one uh, thesis that has been already published about uh, last year or so that looked into um, revising the bearing capacity equation that we currently use for conventional um, soil conditions and bearing and skin friction and trying to develop an equation that would be applicable to, to permafrost. And I think um, the results that have been published uh, so far are, are very promising. So I believe this is also something that uh, is in, under development, but I believe it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be available soon. Hello. Okay, I think that's uh, we don't have that uh, time for any more questions. So thank you so much thank again you. for your excellent and very informative thank presentations. You. Thank you. Too.